love Baltimore. We must spec soon. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Enoch Pratt Free Library. My name is Vivian Fisher, and I am Deputy Chief of the Pratt Library State Library Resource Center here at Central Library. This month, we have had some heavy hitters for our Brown Lecture Series. And to end this month's roster, we are pleased to have our guest, our special guest this evening. But before I introduce our guests, I would like to remind you that next month, we are celebrating the African American Department's 20th anniversary here at the Central Branch. We have a month long, um, we have a month long program, a month long full of programs, and we will kick off the month with Walter Mosley and his latest work, Touch. So check out our campus newsletter and prattlibrary.org for our upcoming programs. And now I am pleased to introduce our phenomenal guest, Misty Copeland, and this evening's moderator, Dr. K. Wise Whitehead. <laughs> On June 30th, 2015, Copeland became the first African-American woman to be promoted to principal dancer in the American Ballet Theater's 75-year history. And the rest, as they say, is history. Copeland has been featured in numerous publications and television programs, including CBS, Sunday Morning, 60 Minutes, The Today Show, The Week with George Stephanopoulos, NBC's in MSNBC's Melissa, Perry, Her Melissa Harris Perry, Vogue, Essence, Ebony, and People Magazine. She was honored with an induction into the Boys and Girls Club National Hall of Fame in May 2012, and received the Breakthrough Award from the Council of Urban Professionals in April of 2012. She was named National Youth of the Year Ambassador for the Boys and Girls Club of America in June 2013, and she received the Young, Gifted, and Black honor at the 2013 Black Girls Rock Awards. Her endorsements, past and present, include American Express, Coach, and Diet Dr. Pepper. And in 2014, Under Armour launched Misty as one of the faces of their I Will What I Want campaign, with a commercial that went viral, gaining over 9 million views to date. Copeland's passion is giving back. She has worked with many charitable organizations and is dedicated to giving of her time to work with and mentor young girls and boys. And in 2014, President Obama appointed her to be the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. She received an honorary doctorate from the University of Hartford and in November 2014 for her contributions to classical ballet and helping to diversify the art form. In addition to her memoir, Copeland, has written several books, including a children's book. And this evening, she will discuss her latest work, The World, The Wind at My Back. Dr. K is an educator, author, radio host, speaker, and documentary filmmaker, known as the mommy, the black mommy activist. She is the founding director of the Carson Institute for Race, Peace, and Social Justice, a professor of communication and African and African American Studies at Loyola University, and the host of Today with Dr. K on WEAA. She has received numerous awards, including Leader in Diversity, the Vernon Jarrett Medal for Journalistic Excellence. She was selected by the Daily Record as one of Maryland's 100 women, and the Edward D. Morrow Regional Award for Excellence in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, to name a few. She is known by her radio list, known to her radio listeners as Dr. K. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests to the Pratt Library. Mm 
Mm. <laughs> How are you? I am overwhelmed <laughs> by this incredible audience and specifically by seeing so many young people. I'm emotional about it. Just seeing the lines outside of the little brown girls and boys. Thank you. So I'm going to do something that I've never done before. Just want to let you know up front. We asked for questions from the audience, and so many little people ask questions. So why don't we put my questions aside and let's do their questions first? <laughs> And you actually added your name. So I'm gonna let her know, Bridget, who is a younger dancer with Twigs. So do you have any advice? Where is Bridget? Younger dancer with Twigs, last name do. Hello, Bridget. Bridget wants to know, do you have any advice for younger dancers? Yes. Uh, I, I think that something that I constantly am coming back to I'm 41 years old now. I started dancing when I was 13, and I have to remind myself of why I started dancing and the importance of it, going back to the why. And for me, it was because I love it, because I'm passionate about it, because it gave me this beautiful escape. It gave me a way of expressing myself. It gave me an identity before I knew who I was. It gave me a sense of community, so many incredible, beautiful things that we often get caught up in the, the perfection, perfectionism and um, you know, comparing yourself to other dancers. And it's so important to enjoy yourself because you're going to get so much out of this, no matter what it is you decide to do, whether you go on to dance professionally, you're, you're already gaining so many skills and tools that you will carry on with you wherever you go in life. I love it. Um, so I'm looking for Esperanza, she's seven. She had a question and she wants to know, what do you do when you get nervous? Um, music has always been like a, a sense of grounding for me. That was my number one love before dance. Music is what drew me to uh, dance. Um, and it's something that I put on that brings me back to myself. Um, and it can be a variety of music. I may be about to go on stage and perform Swan Lake at the Metropolitan Opera House at Lincoln Center. And I might put on some Mariah Carey or some Drake or some Anita Baker. But it's just something that makes me feel comforted, grounded, um, breathing, being, a, being in an environment that, um, again, is comforting. So that may be being with my peers, people I've been in the company with at American Ballet Theater for many years, that I can just feel like this is, a, this is normal. We prepare, we work, we rehearse, we're in class every single day to prepare us to perform. So you shouldn't feel that this is something I can't do. This is something you've prepared for. And so I like to be in an environment that's really normal and what I, what I might experience every day. So it's not that different if I'm going on stage. So hello, my name is Lola, and I'm excited to be here. Lola, I'm reading your question, girl. <laughs> I was wondering who your biggest role model is and why. I, I have so many role models and, and throughout different stages in my life and in my career and mentors that have been a part of my life. Um, well, this book, <laughs> Raven Wilkinson has definitely been key um, in my life and in my career. Uh, you know, there, there are so many black and brown dancers and d just dancers period. I mean, Paloma Herrera was probably like the ballerina I was obsessed with growing up. Um, she was the first uh, ballerina that I saw, saw live. Uh, it was American Ballet Theater performing in Los Angeles, and she was performing the part of Kitri and Don Quixote. 
and she was like the youngest principal dancer I think the company had had. She was 19, I think, when she was promoted to principal dancer. So there was something I was just so drawn to about her and this fiery character and this uh, Kitri who kind of stand on her, stood on her own and had this sense of like um, agency over herself that I was so attracted to that drew me to Paloma and how she approached that character. But uh, Raven in particular, I think because she had been the only in her company at the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo in the 1950s, the only black woman, the first black woman. She was a soloist in her company, which was like unheard of at that time. And I connected with her and she gave me a sense of purpose that was bigger than myself, um, you know, within my career. Whereas I thought of myself as, of course, I was a black woman, but I was striving to be the best dancer I could be and to be a soloist and to maybe eventually be a principal dancer. But she made me look at my life and career in a, in a much bigger way that I was representing so many that might not ever get a chance to see themselves reflected on a stage when they come to a performance. I have a question by Dylan Murphy, who actually drew a little picture of ballet slippers. Uh, <laughs> Dylan, we're asking you a question. What is your favorite thing about ballet? Um, there's so many things. I, I think I used to say performing was my favorite thing, but there's something about um, the ritual the consistency, the structure of being in a ballet class, of being in the studio, which is such a sacred space, um, and knowing what to expect day in and day out. As a young person, there was a lot of chaos and instability in my life, um, a lot of moving around, um, not often knowing if there was gonna be a roof over our head or food on the table. And having ballet to turn to day in and day out, knowing I was going to walk into that studio and do my plies and my tendus and go across the floor and prepare for whatever performance, there was this incredible sense of um, security and structure that I was craving as a child. And, and to this day, it's something that I value so much. To have something that you can turn to that's this meditative artistry um, is so incredible. Well, Saida wants to know, what is one specific thing to focus on during an audition? Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think so often when we get into these spaces and you feel you know, outside of yourself and out of control and that um, people are making decisions you know, about and for you, that it's so important to stay grounded and focus on yourself and not pay attention to, you know, in terms of like comparing yourself to other people. I think it's important to acknowledge the people that are around you. That's something that's important to me for young people is that when you're in an auditioning space, that um, it's not always about pushing yourself to the front. You know, people that are watching and, and um, and seeing how you work with others, that's also a big part of being a part of a production or a company or a group. It's not always about yourself, but at the same time, you have to have a sense of self and confidence that you can stand on your own and be proud of all that you've worked for and what you're showcasing. So my name is Lyric, and I go to Ballet Nouveau School. Hi, Lyric. There she is. Hi. <laughs> So we're going to ask one of your four questions, Lyric. <laughs> so thank you for all of them. Um, but Lyric is asking about your dancing shoes. How many of them do you have? Um, so I typically, as a professional dancer, go through 10 point shoes per week. Ooh, wow. Yes. <laughs> It's very, very expensive, and I don't pay for them, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Where is Sabine? Because I'm only going to ask a few more from the young people. There she is, waving back there. Hi, Hi Sabine. <laughs> Sabine wants to know, well, she has two really good questions. So, Sabine, I'm actually asking both of these. But she wants to know, do you have any hobbies other than dancing? And then what are your plans for the future? Good question, oh, wow. Sabine. 
I'm like, we don't even need to have this conversation after these two questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of takes care of it all. Um, my hobbies I have, I love to cook. It's like one of my favorite things to do. I love to travel, I love to cook, I love to eat. I enjoy, you like to eat too? <laughs> um, the future, I mean, I feel like I've had a really like incredible opportunities that have happened throughout my life and my career that have led me to not feel like when ballet ends, like what's next? And that's often the case for a lot of dancers, that there's not a lot of um, nurturing and guidance into what's next. And there's so many possibilities when you have exposure to the arts. Arts education is so vital and so important. And because of all of those incredible tools and skills that I've gained, I can use them in so many different fields. I have my production company, Life in Motion Productions, where I have a ton of projects in development. I produced and started my first short film that premiered at Tribeca Film Festival this year. I have my foundation, the Misty Copeland Foundation, and our first uh, signature program that's a free ballet class that's being offered to um, under-resourced communities in the Bronx and in Harlem. Um, and I, this is, I think, is it my ninth or eighth book? Eighth book. I'm working on many more. Um, so there's, uh, I have a clothing line, an athletic wear line that recently came out called Greatness Wins um, that I founded with Derek Jeter. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff for the future. <laughs> Good question, Sabine. <laughs> Where's Elliot? Is Elliot in the audience? Elliot asked the question I was gonna start with. There he is, hi Elliot. <laughs> His parents are holding him up. Elliot asked a really good question that somebody might have helped him with. He said, how do you feel about being one of the first African-American dancers to get a role in a big recital? Wow, these questions are fantastic. They are good. Um, you know, it can, it can be, it can hold a lot of weight and, and feel like a lot of pressure to be in that position and you know being the first. But something that has always kept me focused and kept me grounded has been acknowledging the past and, and, and history that doesn't often get acknowledged or isn't often documented. Um, that's what keeps me feeling like I'm not alone in this journey. That's why I wrote this book. <laughs> That's why I wrote Black Ballerinas. Um, you know, it's, it's important that we acknowledge that I am not the first to do this, though I am the, the first at American Ballet Theater. There have been so many who have set the stage for me, who have opened doors and made it easier, who didn't have the access or opportunities that I have. And I'm just so fortunate to, to be in this position and it, with, within this timing. It's all about timing. Well, we have one final question from a young person. But I do want to thank uh, Ivy, even though I'm, Ivy, already, her question has already been asked. But she said she is with the Ballet Nouveau School. She said she's one of your biggest fans. So I want to thank you, Ivy. And Carter, I'm not sure if Carter, where he is. Where is Carter? Hi. Hi. How you doing, Ms. Carter? We're going to ask your question, the last question from our young people. But I thought it was a, a good question because it says, why do you love dancing? But I want to use that as a foray into a bigger discussion because when you think about your commitment and your passion to the task, and how difficult it was to get into that space, even with all of those obstacles, what is that thing about dancing that you really love about it? I had never felt more like myself than when I experienced dancing. Um, coming from a single parent home, one of six children, I'm the fourth of six, I'm a middle child, very shy, introverted, didn't always feel like there was a lot of hope for a future. Um, you know, watching my mom who was adopted and didn't have a lot of grounding herself and in, in, um, in really kind of guiding her children. Um, 
the one thing that we all shared in common in my family was this love of music and, and found that as a way of expressing ourselves. And my mother also danced. Um, and it just always made me feel like I was an individual and that what I had to say was important and valued. I was seen. Um, and th this sense of pride. I remember being in high school and no one really knew who I was or my name. I think I was just like Doug and Chris's brother or sister, like that was, you know, the Copla, Copeland sister. Um, but ballerina became my identity. And I was so proud of that because it was something that I worked for and that was my own. I want to ask you. Yes, definitely. And thank you to all the young people who thank you. asked such brilliant questions that gave us a nice way to move into our discussion. One of your most popular commercials, I Will What I Want. I want to talk about that because I think it's a sentiment. But you tap into the beginning of the book and you write about being pregnant with a black son and your fears and concerns. Like we can will what we want, but in a society, trying to raise young black men, it's not always our will that gets done. So can you talk about that conflict that you experienced just in writing the first few pages of the book? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I mean, those two subjects are very interesting, like within my life, because within um, that commercial in it of itself and, um, you know, trying to find a way to prove to the broader world, you know, pop culture that um, ballet is relevant, ballet is important, and Black people do this, and it's, and, it's, and it's athletic in it of itself was a challenge, and I feel like that's what we did with this partnership with Under Armour and this commercial, and, you know, at the same time, it's like I'm stepping into the shoes of so many black women who've experienced what it is to birth a black child, let alone a black son, and what that means. And I feel like it's, it's made me step back and have a different perspective and understanding um, of what it is to nurture, what it is to mentor, what it is to be a mentee, what it is to create, what it is to be an artist. Um, it's just given me a very different outlook on all of those things. And I feel like I'm more sensitive and more empathetic. Um, and I feel like as much as, you know, I've been asked a lot, are you still dancing? Um, you know, what is it like to be on stage post having a child? And I feel like, having given birth to my son, it's made me step back and think there are so many more things I need to do um, that I've put so much focus, and I was just saying the importance of focusing on yourself when you're in auditions, and that it's so important as an artist, as a dancer, as an athlete, um, to focus on yourself in those years where you're really honing your craft. And I've put 23 years into doing that. And I feel like I'm at a point now where I, you know, setting this example for my son, being present, being home, and also building on these other things that I think are equally as important as me being on a stage and being present um, are what I've been doing in the last three years. Do you think now that, that you're a mother and in that space about how difficult it must have been for your mother to send you away so you can focus on that. It, it seems yeah. difficult when you're a child watching your mother make right. this decision, but now you're a mother. Can yeah. you talk about how challenging that must have been and that decision your mother made for you to become a better dancer or be that dancer? I, it's wild to think about it now. I mean, my son's a year and a half and I'm like, I can't imagine him like ever letting him out of my sight. <laughs> Mine is 22, uh, let me just tell you. <laughs> you know, let him go at some point, right? <laughs> um, but I feel like I had, I had an understanding. Again, I'm, I'm one of six children. My, my mother had, you know, didn't have an easy time like raising, raising us, um, me and my siblings. And so I feel like I had empathy for her at the time and in understanding like what it was to let me go. I mean, she really truly let me go when I was 13 years old, when I started dancing 
um, it was such a late age to start, and you know, my teachers had this goal in mind that I was going to dance professionally, which mean, which meant I needed to get all the training, um, you know, in order to become pro professional within four or five years, which is like not common. Um, and my mom let me go and live with my ballet teacher and her family. Um, and that was a, I, I can't imagine what that must have felt like for her. And so I feel like by the time I moved to New York City when I was 17 to join American Ballet Theater, I understood the sacrifices she was making for me as well um, that I'm forever grateful for. And, um, but at the same time, it's like you have to, you sometimes have to let your children go so that they can grow um, and experience things that you might not be able to give them. The world is in kind of a chaotic place right now. And people often look to artists to help us make sense of it. Can you talk a little bit about artivism, which is this connection between art and activism, using your art to potentially impact the world? This is so important to me, especially at this point in my life and in my career the importance of using my voice and using my platform um, to reach as many people as I can and to say something that matters and that means something and that might be able to make a difference. Um, art activism is something that I'm consciously aware of, like through my production company, we were talking about it backstage. Um, the first project that I've produced on my own and, and starred in this film, um, is an art activism piece. And it's a short film, it's a silent film, so there's no dialogue. It's all told through movement and dance. And it's focused on the community of Oakland, California. It's focused on the social issues that are ex that they are experiencing. So dance in, in art doesn't, you know, I mean, we all know this. It's not always about celebration and, and um, beauty, but it can be about bringing awareness to trauma and tragedy and trying to, you know, highlight and bring awareness to an issue that um, we should all be paying attention to. And so, you know, I feel like the arts can heal and unite, unify. Um, it's a universal language, dance is specifically. Um, you don't have to all speak the same language to understand what we're saying through movement and dance. And I think there's something that's so powerful about that that really lends itself to this art activism. I want to talk about racism in ballet, because you talk about moving into that space as a Black woman and the challenges around that. Can you talk a bit about what it was really like and then what you did to overcome it and then end with, has it gotten any better? I think first and foremost, like it's important for me to acknowledge that I'm a biracial woman. And I'm a light-skinned woman. And I was raised that by my mother that it doesn't matter how much black you have in you, it's how you're going to be viewed and perceived by the world. And so I've always identified as a black woman. But I say all of that to say that it has made my experience very different from a lot of black women who have entered the ballet world and the dance world. But it's still been extremely difficult <laughs> for me. Um, it's, it's been, you know, I, I walked into American Ballet Theater at 17 years old and I was the only black woman in the company, 90 plus dancers for the first decade of my career and didn't really have anyone to turn to within the company. So, you know, I'm, in my mind, I'm like, I'm coming from Los Angeles, which is diverse, you know, depending on where you live. And I'm thinking I'm moving to Manhattan and New York City, like this amazing, like, you know, cultural Mecca. And I spend eight hours a day only seeing white people. <laughs> and it was like mind blowing to me. And it does a lot for like your, your sense of self and identity. And, um, and it took me not only uh, reaching out to people outside of the ballet world, but accepting guidance from people that were outside of um, American Ballet Theater, which Raven was one of them, and, and, a t and you know, a ton of other black and brown people um, that didn't necessarily come from the ballet world, but it maybe had been the first within their fields and in their careers. But um, I don't know, I mean, 
there have just been so many scenarios and situations where I came into the company being this extraordinary talent and being told I was a prodigy, getting into the company with only four years of ballet training. And then all of a sudden I was told, you don't have the right body type. You're not good enough. You shouldn't be doing this role because you won't, uh, you will ruin the aesthetic of the corps de ballet because you're the only brown body. Um, you can't be in this performance while we're filming it because we want it to look pure and be like everyone is the same. And again, this is coming from someone who was very fair skinned compared to a lot of black dancers, through, you know, in the world. And so, you know, there's, there's, this was always something that I wasn't afraid to address. And again, having incredible mentors and guidance allowed me to feel confident enough and prepared enough to have these difficult conversations with the artistic staff, with my artistic director, to go in there and say, these are the issues that I'm experiencing and that I'm seeing and that I'm feeling and doing all of that and trying not to be emotional as like a 19 year old girl, um, you know, is a difficult weight you know, to, to hold and to carry, um, you know, but I always felt that it was so important for me to do all that I could while I was in this space because I didn't know if I would ever see another black woman in the company with me. So I felt like I'm going to go out fighting <laughs> if that's what I need to do. But what did you lose in the process? So by speaking up, you were 19, you were being told these things, what did you lose in, in making that decision? I don't think of anything as a loss. Um, I mean, maybe people might say time. You know, I, I, I've had a, a much longer kind of trajectory to getting to where I am than most people would um, who make it to principal dancer. It took me 15 years, which is like unheard of in the ballet world. By then you're like retired. <laughs> Um, and I waited it out because I've always felt like my path and my journey has not been like anyone else. And I can't continue to think I have to do these things in the way that Paloma Herrera has or that Raven has. It was like, I'm going to keep my eye on the prize and doing this for the right reason, getting on stage because I love it, um, trying to find focus um, in times when things seem overwhelming and think about who is this for? It's for all of these little ones in the audience that can see representation. All of those, all of those reasons. Is that a heavy burden to bear? And yes, please. Mm -hmm. So I come back to my question because when I talk to people who are like you, where we see it from the outside and all we see is a success. We don't see the tears, we don't see the bloody ballet shoes, we don't see pieces of yourself being lost along the way, we only see the success. But you're carrying a burden, you said you're doing it for those that are coming after you. Can you talk a bit about having to carry that? Because you've been carrying it for a very long time. Yeah. Um. It, you know, I think when you're living it day to day that you often like forget about the journey. <laughs> My manager, Gilda, often reminds me of like where we've come from and how hard we work to get here. And I need that reminder sometimes because, you know, again, it's like I want I want to enjoy those beautiful moments. And um, but I have to remember how hard I've worked to get here, you know, and and. You know, I, I often think about Arthur Mitchell and Dance Theater of Harlem and what he created um, in order for so many black and brown dancers to have a space where they could thrive and they could have opportunity and they could um, have something that they were not offered in any other space. And how difficult it was for me to be offered a position in his company as a soloist when I was very young and to say to, to Mr. Mitchell, I'm sorry, but I'm going to stay with American Ballet Theater. 
but I knew that there was a bigger purpose in, in mind. And, you know, when I think about this weight, like to me, again, it's not weight. It's like I have this one chance. And it would have been so comfortable for me to dance with Dance Theater of Harlem and be surrounded by people who look like me. And that's an amazing place for so many people and a space that we need. But I felt like if I don't do this at ABT, I'm, I've already got my foot in the door. Like I can, I can maybe with the work and the focus and the support make some kind of change in this white space for the next generation. Can you talk a little bit? So you mentioned how you were dealing with body positivity, not you, but you were being told not just the brown body, but your body type and what people are seeing from the outside and what you were kind of being pigeonholed into what they wanted on the stage. I wanna to get to talking about the morning to keep it pure because I do wanna talk yeah. about that. But can you talk a bit about that? Because we know that, that all women and girls struggle with this, but black women and girls, that body positivity piece, mm -hmm. we hear from our hair all the way down, from our skin texture, our color, shade every single aspect of our lives gets diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a bit about that and just offer some words of, of advice to any young woman or young girl in the audience who's struggling with body positivity? Um, what's, what I've always come back to and, I, and I've dealt with is so, so many changes in my body, which is so normal. And I think it's important to acknowledge that that we change and evolve as people from day to day, from year to year, um, and that it's okay. I, especially, you know, and it's something that we don't really uh, have support around for young people that are becoming professionals between the ages of 15 and 19 when your body is changing, you're going through puberty. To me, it's mind blowing, you know, that you come into this professional career and there's no support and guidance. It's just like, why is your body changing? I'm like, well, because I'm going through puberty and I'm a teenager. That's why my body's changing. And I should have support in how to take care of my body instead of just being told, go lose weight or pay this amount of money to go see this expensive nutritionist when I'm making $200 a week. <laughs> um, and so I think I had, I had an understanding of that, but I didn't have support immediately within the company. Um, and so when my body started to change, I no longer was um, this kind of chosen one. Um, and, you know, and I started, I was starting to be, to I went from being told you have the perfect proportions and body for ballet to you do not have the body for ballet. And, um, you know, it took me about a year to understand that like, I come from a background where we were in survival mode what I was eating had nothing to do with being an athlete, fueling my body. It was like, this is what's available to you, and this is what you need to eat to survive. And so that was not at all my mentality, becoming a professional athlete. Um, so it really took time to change my mindset and understand that what I'm putting into my body is, is directly affecting how I'm performing, you know, and, and to me it was more about how I'm performing, not what I looked like. So it was like changing my mindset about you need to be your healthiest self. You're not ever going to look like someone else. You can't give yourself this goal of like, I'm gonna look like this person because that you are who you are and all you can do is have control over being your healthiest self. So once I understood that, then it was like deciphering what the system was saying, which was, even if I became my healthiest self, it was still like, you were wrong for this. And it was not because of my body type, it was because of the color of my skin. And once I understood that, then I could really focus on uh, having those conversations and having a support system that allowed me to understand how to have those conversations um, where I could directly um, address those things. And I have to say that I'm fortunate again to have support that was people that were on the board of American Ballet Theater that were black. 
that were giving me support in how to speak to the artistic staff because that's not always the case. I know that there are so many black and brown dancers in companies that if they say something, they're, they're compromising whether or not they're gonna be fired. And, um, and so I just felt like I, maybe I have an advantage in some way and so I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity. And I must say that, you know, during, during the pandemic and, you know, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter that I have seen a shift um, in a way that, you know, during that time, it was like I was no longer the only voice in a lot of these situations because a lot of these dancers felt empowered and safe to share their experiences and their stories. Can you talk a little bit? Yes. <laughs> I want to give you time to clap, because definitely. Um, I would want you to talk a little bit about your roles, because you've been in a lot of different ones. And these are ballets that when people think about white space, ballet in a lot of ways is a part of the white space that you were moving into. So you're taking these these pieces and making them your own. But can you talk about some of your favorites, some of your most challenging ones? Like, you know, from your perspective, when you step out there, which are the roles that you completely embody and maybe the ones that you might struggle with a little bit? Um, the amazing thing about performing in a, in a live art form, you know, not, it's, it's not like acting and, and you know, film and television um, where there's editing involved, but, you know, you can prepare as much as possible. And, you know, you often don't have a lot of input when it comes to, um, you know, these roles that have been created on dancers in, I don't know, the 17, 1800s. And it's just, you're, you're, you're doing the same exact steps and there's, you don't have a lot of freedom. Um, but something that's amazing about performing live is that when you get on stage, you can kind of just do what you want. <laughs> And that's something that, um, I mean, not going crazy and like changing the choreography, but um, this, to me, I've always felt this sense of freedom in a way where, you know, you're taking in all of the incredible um, advice and experience and knowledge from people who have done the roles and it's passed down to you, which is so incredible about ballet, this, this incredible tradition of passed down knowledge and experience, but you go on stage and you make it your own. And, you know, Romeo and Juliet, doing Juliet is probably one of my favorite roles and something that I feel like I've truly been able to take and make as human as possible. And to me, that's what makes it relatable. When people come to see performances, they want to relate in some way and they want it to feel human and they want it to feel grounded. And so I feel like in every role I'm performing, I try to find something with an experience, something that I can connect to the character, whether it's fire, the Firebird or um, Swanilda and Coppelia. Uh, there's so many roles, but I would say the most difficult for a variety of reasons is Swan Lake. <laughs> it is the hardest role in the ballerina's repertoire. I know it's like people say um, Aurora and Sleeping Beauty or Swan Lake. Hands down, it's Swan Lake. <laughs> um, technically, you know, just in terms of the, the character approach and changing characters from the white swan to the black swan, back to the white swan. Um, but this incredible history of black women being told they are not the white swan. And so, I mean, we, I talk about it in the book, but just Raven Wilkinson had said it. I mean, I don't know, in many interviews, over the past like 40 years, but like that she didn't think she would ever see a, a black woman perform the role of Swan Lake in, in, a, in, a, in a major ballet company. Um, and so when I was cast to uh, cast in that role, I mean, it was, it was a shock. It was a shock to me. It was just like, re, like, I don't know if I can, like, it just was a different type of pressure and a different type of weight that just felt like if, in my mind, it was like, if I don't perform this role to the standard and expectation of so many people, will this ever be given to another black woman? Um, and so that was incredible. <laughs> um, you know, an incredible weight to carry when it's already 
you know, such a, a stressful uh, role to take on um, that at one point became so overwhelming that it crippled me um, technically in, 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 you know, some parts of the ballet. And, you know, it took me kind of stepping back and just saying, I have to make this my own. Like, I can't try and make this like any other ballerina before me. Um, I have to make this my own because in the end, it's, it's about how, how you make the audience feel. It's not about coming to the performance and counting how many fouettes and, and how long someone balances on point. It's how they make you feel. It's the character they portray. In the end, ballet and the technique is a tool to tell a story. So So when I read that in the book, that's why I asked you about it, because I didn't understand. As someone who doesn't dance, or not dance well, dance, but I didn't understand exactly what that meant, why she said that. So can you talk about Raven? Because we've woven her all the way through, but I want to give you space to talk about the incredible impact she had on molding you, shaping you, believing you, encouraging you, cajoling you, pushing you, dragging you. <laughs> to get you to where you are now? Because I think we're talking a lot about mentor, mentee, but what does it mean to have unconditional love and support of someone and believe in them so firmly that there are moments you didn't believe in yourself, but she believed in you and that was enough for you. Yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. Again, I've been so fortunate to have incredible support and mentors that have looked like so many things throughout my life and my career. Um, and there was just something so unique about Raven and her approach and just her presence that was just kind of there. It wasn't ever kind of pushed upon me, which sometimes I needed. Um, she came into my life at a time when I was ready for her. Um, I, I learned about her when I was, I was injured at the time and I was watching a film I was like, I'm going to be a bunhead and I'm going to learn about this history of, you know, one of the first uh, major ballet companies in America, the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. And when I saw this black woman come onto the, onto the screen, um, you know, towards the end of this film, I was like, what? I had no idea that this woman danced in this company, the only black woman in the 1950s, and that she was promoted to soloist. And um, it just, it, it shocked me and made me feel like, you know, seeing her journey within this film and learning about it and Googling and trying to find as much as I could in that time, because there wasn't a lot available online. Um, and knowing all that she went through, the company toured through the South for a lot of their, their touring um, schedule. And she, you know, during, you know, Jim Crow South and segregation and um, was often, either not allowed to perform, her life was being threatened, she was being chased off the stage or from the tour bus by the KKK. Um, and it was just like, if she went through that and still has this incredible love of dance and joy and comes to the ballet to support, I, I can do anything. Um, and then I found out that she lived a block away from me on the Upper West Side of New York. And I was like, why? And we became really close friends. And, you know, it was, it was a relationship that I'd never experienced. I've always had a love for, like, you know, a, 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 a curiosity and an understanding and a respect and love for, like, these, these intergenerational relationships. And she just kind of, like, you know, was off the charts, um, where she was just so caring and loving and was never preaching to me. It never felt like she was teaching or that I was learning a lesson. She was just speaking. She would share a story here and there about her life and or encourage me in, in a small way, you know, go in there and talk to your artistic director. It's like, it's not a big deal, you know, like if you don't do it, like then, you know, if you do it, if you don't, like what's, you know, what's the big deal? It just never felt like this heavy burden or something that she was putting on me in the way that she mentored. It felt so easy and so loving and so caring. Um, you know, I was just so fortunate to have her in my life. And this picture in particular was so 
was just, it just kind of wrapped up our entire relationship. Um, you know, Raven surprised me. This was the very first performance that I performed of Swan Lake at Lincoln Center. And um, she came on stage and presented me with the flowers at the end of the performance. And it's not, it's usually men who uh, come on stage and present the flowers and to have a woman, a black woman, someone who should have been performing on that stage in her time but wasn't allowed to and wasn't given that opportunity to come onto that stage. And um, she gave me the flowers and I gave them back to her and I got on my knee and was bowing. And it was just like this up and down and flowers being passed back and forth. <laughs> And it was such an incredible moment. But in the end, it was like me and the cast stepped back, stepped back, and she fluttered her arms like a swan. And it was just like, oh, this is her moment. And it was so incredible. <laughs> so before I ask you your final question, I would like to ask all of the young dancers in the room to stand up. If you are a young dancer, stand up. Thank you so much for standing. Thank you so much for coming. You have more on the front row. This is amazing. So I wanted you to stand so she can see you. Hi. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for coming. Because you said that the work you're doing is for them. Yeah. And so I wanted you just to see them. Thank you. Because I do that. think that matters it does. that we have all of these young, beautiful, brilliant black and brown dancers who stood in a line around the corner to see you because what they are doing and what they're seeing is what you didn't. Like you are right here in front of them. And so if you ever think about your legacy, your legacy is in the next dancer coming forward. And so before your last question, just thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And so now for your last question. So I know you're still young. And you have a, a son who's a year and a half. But I want you to go with me. Just go about 50 years out from when your journey's done. So when you run on ahead to see how the end is going to be, as my Nana used to say, what do you want young dancers of all races, all ethnicities, all genders, what do you want them to know about you and about your journey? I, I think first it would it would be to um, to to remember to know that I I worked my hardest to be the best dancer I could be, um, but I think most importantly is to know that I've worked so hard to try and create a better. This might make sense, you know. I'm like trying to try to create change, you know. Ring the bells. Um, <laughs> You know that that I'm trying that I've tried to create a space that is more equitable, that is more fair, that is more um, inclusive. That you know that in the end, dance and art is for everyone, and that it's to bring joy, it's to bring fulfillment, it's to bring happiness, it's to allow us to express ourselves and feel emotions. Um, but that I've worked to make this space a more inclusive space. Misty Copeland, folks. Thank you.